여러분들이 그 금융 사기에 대해서 좀 예방 대처를 좀 배우시고 앞으로 더 이상 이런 일이 일어나지 않도록 어, 주의하셨으면 하는 차원에서 저희들이 어, 예방 세미나를 준비했습니다. 그래서 어, 오늘 이어지는 모든 그 프로그램은 영어로 할 거고요. 어, 끝나고 이 저희들이 세미나가 다 끝나고 나중에 <웃음> 리아하고 저하고 여러분들이 몇 분들이 이렇게 한국말로 통역을 해서 거기에 대한 내용들을 다시 시어할 거예요. 그러니까 예, 이해가 안 되시면 잠깐 참으시고 나중에 저희들이 다 통역을 해서 알려드리겠습니다. 그래서 오늘 아 오늘 저희, 저희들이 좀 소개해 시켜드릴 분들이 계시니까 아, 우선 어, 트레이시 케이스 본네 카운티에서 어, 검사 하시다가 지금 이제 판사 하신 지가 지금 3년째 되셨거든요. 그래서 본네 카운티에서 한 20년 어, 일을 하셨어요. 그래서 어, 친합하시고 저희 이제 한국 분들은 굉장히 좋아하시고 그래서 저희들도 어, 좋아합니다. 예. I was saying how much we like you. Okay, I was saying s o m e t h i n <laughs> yeah. Also, I was just uh, explaining to you that you, you've been working with the Green County for over 20 years uh, as a prosecutor, and now you're a judge. And uh, 그리고 다음 판사로 또 출마를 하십니다. 그래서 혹시 군의 카운티에 계시면 예 주기령 지역 해로 줬다가 예 마음에 드시면 투표해 주시면 되겠습니다. 자 그다음에 우리 패티 갯슨 이분은 어, 군의 카운티에서 어, 검사장으로 어, 선출되신 작년에 선출되신 분이세요. 예, 그래서 어, 저희 한인 커뮤니티하고도 아주 친밀하게 어, 지금 어, 같이 활동을 하면서 예, 우리가 관계를 이어가고 있습니다. 그래서 특별히 어, 우리 어, 검사장님을 초대했습니다. 어, let me introduce everyone here. Uh, Patsy Gatson. She is the g u n e t County District Attorney, and, um, and she's very supportive to, to, the, to the Korean and Asian community, and she's willing to work with us. So she always comes when I ask to come to do any, any seminar. She's, she never say no, so she's great. So hopefully that she will continue her job uh, throughout the next term. Um, And uh, we thank you for attending uh, today's seminar. And we have Lisa Mary Bristol. 이분은 um, 지금 변호사신데 어, 지금 군의 카운티 어, 뭐죠? 어, 경범죄. 예, 경범죄. 예, 경범죄 검사장으로 출마를 하세요. 어, 그래서 어, 제가 저희들이 초대한 이유는 그것보다도 이분이 어, 교수로도 활동을 하시거든요. 그래서 캐네스, 캐네스, right? You, you teach at Kansas University, Georgia State. I'm sorry, Georgia State. Georgia State 법대에서 어, <웃음> 교수로도 활동을 하고 계시는데 이분이 담당하시는 게 뭐냐면은 그 시니어 시리즌 스캔. 시니어 시리즌들이 어, 당하는 그런 그 문제점을 어, 포커스를 하시는 분이세요. 그래서 저희, 제가 특별히 초대를 했습니다. 예. 리스 메일빌 스토어. 예. 그리고 어, 여러분들도 많이 아시는 분이죠. 예. 우리 송우. 송우 씨는 어, 변호사시고 지금 어, What district are you? What are you? Uh, one of the Jiuhaiwan one. 구약 103번. 103번. 예. 이번에 이제 출마하시는데 어, 저번에 출마하시다가 안 됐어요. 그래서 이번에 꼭 됐으면 좋겠습니다. 그래서 음. 여러분이 투표하러 가시다가 이름이 기억하시면 꼭 투표해 주시고 네. 감사합니다. 오케이, okay, Tracy, I'll hand it off to you. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Clayton indicated, I am Tracy c a s e n one of your Superior Court judges here in Gwinnett County. And uh, this subject matter came to mind, of course, I worked with Clayton when I was with the DA's office about uh, victims' rights and teaching people how to protect themselves from violent crimes, but often overlooked are the uh, financial crimes that people are victims of. 
And actually my first year on the bench, I had a couple of cases that involved the case, the investment clubs. And so I reached out to some individuals I knew uh, in the Korean community and some attorneys to say, how can we get this information out? And then of course COVID hit and uh, finally uh, within the last few months, Clayton uh, got back with me so that we could get this information out. So what we wanna talk about tonight is gonna be how uh, you can protect yourselves from being victims of financial uh, crimes and financial theft. And what we want to make sure we emphasize is, uh, at least with respect to the K, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, it's a phenomenal program that the community has to support each other uh, when individuals can't get uh, financing through traditional banks. The community comes together and provides that service. Unfortunately, when things go awry sometimes with the way they're handled, there's not a lot of recourse that can be taken. So we wanna make sure we get that information out so individuals can make informed decisions. And I think this panel is gonna be able to do that. Uh, so <clears throat> obviously one of the issues that I uh, saw in my case, the two cases that I had, is that we didn't have a lot of evidence. And so I wanna ask uh, uh, Sue first, explain to our group what it takes first to have a legally enforceable contract. Sure. Um, so thank you so much for being here and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, so growing up in Korea, I know all about K. Um, you know, my family has participated in it. I know family's friends have participated in it. And, um, and I've had clients that have come to me about the issue. Um, and I know that issue is, is not something that a lot of people want to talk about. Um, and I think it's just a cultural thing. But as far as um, evidence goes, there is a lack of evidence. And that's gonna be always the issue because a lot of us in the Korean community, we do things by trust and we do things by verbal agreement. So, um, a lot of cases, legally, we, we need paper trail, we need um, things that are written down as far as how much was given to whom at what time, and oftentimes with K, we don't have that because you it is done by trust. And so um, I always encourage my clients to make sure that it doesn't have to be a legal document, but to have something on paper that shows how much you've paid, when, to whom, and um, that may be just a little bit enough to prove and have a little bit of evidence so that you can start the case. Um, but without it, obviously, there are times where you may have a verbal agreement, um, but it ends up being he said, she said, and that becomes a very difficult thing, and that's where the judges come in um, and the judge will have to decide, or a jury has to decide who to believe. And so you're kind of taking a risk when it comes to that. And so you talked a little bit about evidence in court, and obviously there are two kinds of ways that you can seek redress in this, and that's filing a civil suit or a, process, a criminal prosecution. So um, this also got to explain kind of the difference of between the civil suit and then the criminal prosecution that your office uh, may uh, pursue on. Um, good evening. Thank you first for having me here. It's an honor to be here to address everyone. And I do think that um, it's very important when we look at what's happening in the Korean community to understand that there are different ways of approaching it because my office would handle the criminal prosecution. And what we would need is some probable cause to start prosecution of a case that impacts the community. And for that, what we need, just like in a civil case, you're gonna have to have some evidence. So that means that people will have to speak up and tell us exactly what happened and who was involved. So that is critical because you know, there's a saying that they have in New York, they say, see something, say something. So we can't just sit back in silence 
and expect there to be redress. We have to have witnesses come to us, tell us what happened, and then from there, what we would do is develop the proof in order to take it to a jury or a judge. So it's imperative that the community um, recognizes, first of all, when you are a victim. And if you are a victim of something that happens in the community, then we are here to help you. So that means you have to come forward and you have to speak with us and then we'll do an investigation or either PD will do an investigation and um, you know we could help. But without your cooperation and willingness to come forward, we can't help. So you need that in both arenas, in the criminal and in the civil. And I know that um, the community culturally trusts people, but you know we expect folks to be honest that we come in contact, right? But it doesn't always happen that way. They're not always honest, and they're not always straightforward. So just be on the lookout because that really concerns me when you talk about elderly people being taken advantage of. Because sometimes you have folks involved in their whole life savings, and things that they've worked extremely hard for being taken out from under them. And that's what we don't want to see, but we will do what we can do in the district attorney's office to help in situations that come up. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Wurzel, you are currently prosecuting in DeKalb, but prosecuted in Gwinnett for several years. When a case comes to the DA's office to help try to address the situation, what can a victim expect as far as an outcome if the person were to be convicted or to plead guilty in the criminal case? Well, thank you. I, I also want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Um, this is actually an issue that's very near and dear to my heart. I am of Caribbean descent and we call what you all call a ke is what my family calls a susu. susu. And a susu and my mother has actually run a susu my entire life and so in our susu or some islands call it a partner um, we have different names for it in different islands <clears throat> and so we're very familiar with this and we have different hands is what we call it and so every week everyone who's a part of the susu can put their share in and then every week one person gets to collect the pot Right? right. Um, and depending on how big the susu is, everyone gets their share one week of the susu. And so it can be a, a fantastic tool to help the community kind of get a leg up. But it does require a great amount of trust. It does require integrity. And it requires that everyone that's a part of it um, do their share and carry their load. So I'm very familiar with this. I'm very familiar with it as a tool. Um, it's something that I've grown up and seen my entire life. Um, so if you do unfortunately fall victim to someone who does not honor the tradition of the K and they do take advantage and they are prosecuted in the criminal realm, what you can expect is if they are convicted for a theft or exploitation or any of that, and if they, uh, or if they plead guilty to it, the court does have the option of ordering restitution. And so what that means is as part of their conviction, as part of their probation or their sentence, the court can order that they are required to repay that money to the victims. And so every month or so as part of their supervision, they will be required to pay a portion of that restitution if they can't pay it all up front. Sometimes as part of a negotiation of the plea recommendation or as part of a negotiation in the recommendation made to the court or, or in entering the guilty plea, um, some defendants will come forward and say, hey, I have the money to repay everything at once. Um, sometimes they can't. Sometimes they've spent the money and they need time to pay that off. Um, but the point is the court does have the tools and the power through restitution to make sure that while they're on probation that they are repaying that money bit by bit or in chunks to make the victim whole. And if they don't pay that money back through restitution, the court would then have the power to um, violate their probation. So that means they can't just say you have to repay that money. If they fail to do so, that's a violation of their probation, a violation of their sentence. So there is some actual meat to that, to that order. So there is something for the victims to hold on to for that. 
and that's excellent. So let's say though <clears throat> that individual doesn't have the money and they're ordered to pay restitution and they don't have it so they get their probation violated, they go to jail. Uh, so what other remedies does a victim have in order, I mean it's great that maybe they've been held accountable and they're in jail, but our victim still is out of their money. So what other uh, remedies are there available to that victim? Right, um, and if I could just comment on and add a little bit. Um, so I think that's the difference between a criminal action and a civil action. And oftentimes I tell clients, if you can, if you can have a criminal case, it probably is going to be more beneficial for you to go the criminal route because you're not going to have to spend a lot of money hiring a lawyer, filing a lawsuit, getting a judgment, and a judgment is just a piece of paper. Now you have to collect that judgment from that person versus just um, as what we had talked about, in a criminal action, if they are found guilty, they have something hanging over them that is going to be an incentive for them to pay it back. And so if you, if you have enough evidence and if the prosecutor's office can actually prosecute the case, I think it's always a better route to go, uh, the criminal route versus a civil route. Um, and oftentimes, you know, people are out of the money and so they don't have the money to hire a lawyer and file a civil suit. So I always advise clients to go um, and see whether or not we can go the criminal route first and then if that can't happen, then we can look into the civil, the civil aspect of it. But talk a little bit more about if, even if they've gone the criminal route, they've been ordered to pay restitution, they can't pay it, they're revoked, they're sitting in jail, there are other ways that a victim perhaps can execute that judgment if they get a judgment in a civil case. Like, right, right, going the civil route, obviously. Yes. So. Um, even if there is a criminal case, you can still pursue a civil case. And just as I talked about, you can go ahead and get a judgment. And with the judgment, obviously you have to collect it, but if they own property, um, so any type of assets, if they have a house, if they have cars, you can put a lien on any of their properties. If they have a job where they uh, are getting paychecks, you can garnish their paychecks they have a bank account that you know about, then you can do a bank garnishment as well through the judgment. So they are, it's definitely, just because you go the criminal route doesn't mean that it, it prevents you from going the civil route. And if you do collect, obviously, it you know it's gonna bounce off, you're not gonna double collect from the criminal case and the civil case. So if you can do so, you can definitely pursue both criminal and civil. And I'll add, sure. Just adding to the civil lien option as well, if you do place a lien on them, because say they don't have money when they enter a guilty plea or they're found guilty, or at one point they just don't have the money, but you go ahead and you put that lien on them and say they inherit a large amount of money. If you have the lien on them, you can collect from their inheritance. So just because they don't have the money today, if they come into that money a couple years down the road and you already have that lien secure against them, you can collect what's rightfully yours from that inheritance. So the liens do have a very helpful, they are very helpful tools um, and they give you other options. You don't always have to kind of be watching them. And it, it protects your rights, your interests in that property, even if um, it happens later on. Now, I think one, we have a question. If, if I may, sure. um, I'll, I'll just sit down. Um, so, we're here because there is a, a case now. Well, wait, we're we're going to get to the positive yeah. statement in just a minute. But, but um, just a quick question. Um, what if an individual put everything else, like all his assets to catch under <clears throat> the family member's name? They usually do that to hide the assets and whatever they have. Um, can, can the prosecution go after that? Who wants that one? Yeah. <laughs> I guess the civil like side, me. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I think they hide everything. Well, I think that's more of a case for the civil side in that you can go for discovery, find out where they're um, sending everything. If you have a civil case, you can ask, you know, where's this? You can ask their bank accounts. And even in a criminal case, if they do have a bank account, we can subpoena records. That happens on both the criminal and the civil side. We can subpoena records 
find out what they're doing as far as the bank is concerned, where that money's going, who they gave a chunk to, you know, so many different uh, frauds that people engage in. And of course, if we have enough um, information, we can charge them with fraud by conversion. It's different ways that we can go after them also. But as I said earlier, we just have to have the evidence and people have to be willing to speak up and not stay silent. And Sue, if you'll talk a little bit about that as far as, you know, once you get that judgment, but at that situation happens, they know they've got a judgment, so they start transferring their assets out of their names. What recourse do you have in the civil realm to get that judgment? Right, and or even before then. So you can, once you secure a judgment, um, again, you can go through the discovery process, and if they actually transfer assets when they knew that they owed, um, even before they actually filed a civil lawsuit, if they knew that they had a claim and they transferred assets, then you can file a fraudulent transfer and essentially get that asset back and be able to collect. So, What if assets were acquired initially from the beginning with the illegal money? Then is this something that could be done? So there's also forensic accountants are a growing field in this area as well. And um, we work with forensic accountants. Um, part of another group that I work with is through the federal government. And what we've learned is, like with the elder abuse cases all over the country, what we're learning is there are more and more scam artists that uh, really have finessed this concept of, you know, taking advantage of people who've worked really, really hard their whole life and coming in and swindling people of their life savings. Um, and they're really creative with it. And so forensic accountants have really taken off and they're really, really good at going through records and being able to trace and see how money is moving, where it's moving, and looking at the pattern of that. There may be situations where a forensic accountant has to be hired to examine these records and look at the pattern, look at the trail, and look and see where that money is going in order to have a better concept and paint a better picture. On the civil side, right? You're it can be used civilly and criminally. Um, a lot of the analysis that is done by forensic, when we talk about forensic accountant work, um, in the work that I've done with elder abuse, it's always been on the criminal side to prove exploitation. Um, but it absolutely is a good tool to use on the civil side as well. And you know, that question actually is a good segue into one of the other issues that was brought to my attention, which is this nationwide Ponzi scheme where this individual is preying on uh, elders that may not be so sophisticated in their financial dealings or computers. Uh, in that situation, uh, and I'll open this up to any of the three of you to talk about uh, when an individual has been um, defrauded out of their money, is that individual's name or is it going to be released whether a criminal action is filed or a civil suit are they going to have to be named in either of those proceedings and if so how can that individual be protected for having made those reports that's a loaded question mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that's a problematic issue because if we're going to charge someone criminally then they have the right to confront witnesses against them. It's going to be extremely difficult for the victim to remain nameless unless that person is a minor or either it's something more serious like a sexual crime. We can keep that name out of the paper. But as far as um, you losing money and not wanting to come forward, you're going to have to come forward because we have um, cases against defendants and they have rights too uh, once they've been accused. So they have a right to confront um, you know, the case against them and we cannot do that without having the witnesses present and being willing to testify. Now if they're concerned about their safety and things of that nature then we'll deal with that. Um, if you have a um, defendant that's done something to you and you feel threatened, nine times out of 10, Judge Case is not gonna give them a bond, okay? They'll be sitting in jail um, as their case comes up and they could be, be, they could be sitting there for a long time. 
So just as, as I said before, as victims, you cannot sit back and take it. You have to come to us and let us know what's going on and you will uh, be in a situation where you'll have to say, you know, who you are, but at the same time, until we know about it, we can't do anything about it. So even when you know what's going on, even if you don't want to be the one to come forward, encourage people to come forward so that we can handle what's happening. And Lisa Marie, in your experience with elder abuse, uh, is there a way for maybe a family member to step in or is that not going to be possible? Family members can step in on behalf of the victim if capacity is at issue. So if we have an elder who doesn't have the capacity to perhaps stand trial or to speak on their own behalf, um, if a conservatorship is in place, um, if there's issues with their um, mental health for that reason, <clears throat> me, sometimes there may be some co diminished cognitive abilities then there may be the opportunity for family members to step in in that capacity. Um, power of attorneys may be in place or, or things of that nature. Um, but even in that capacity, it would mean that it, it is the representative of that person on their behalf. Um, so it would still be the victim, the victim's interests being represented just by another person who could speak on their behalf and it would be for limited purposes because the capacity might be compromised or it might be deteriorating or things of that nature. Um, what we do see oftentimes is, um, unfortunately, elder people who might have diminished capacity are the most vulnerable, right? Because people may not believe them or it's easier to confuse them or just take advantage of them. Um, and so what we don't wanna do is say, well, because you're unable to stand up and say this is wrong, you don't have a case. So we wanna make sure that we're able to protect them as well and give them a voice, even if they can't speak up on their own behalf. And you had a question, sir. Yes, um, um, with the, the committee report, I covered many of the case and, uh, about the, uh, the pyramid um, fund scheme. They already um, got the police report and everything, but they still, we are the, my mothers, I, I mean, the, our parents, the same age, there's many senior, right? They want to get back the money from the attacker, right? So how can do it? This is just waiting, or do they uh, hire another attorney, or the civil case, or another the legal case? So your question is, how can we get our money back? Yes, right. All right. After so, a police report has already been yes. done, yeah. and you, got, you are just waiting? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, I think that's for prosecutor. <laughs> I think that's for the district attorney. <laughs> and so let me actually do this additional question. It's also got to talk, answer his question, but also let's say after that police report is filed, can the victim still contact the defendant to try to get their money back even though a police report has been filed? That would more or less be against my recommendation because if you have filed a police report, that person has committed a crime. And we really don't know what they're capable of. I would suggest um, that once the police report is filed, there has to also be an investigation. Because it's just it's more than just merely you filing a police report. It's digging down, finding the information that's going to cause the police to be able to go out, get evidence, um, get a warrant to arrest that person. So it's not just as simple as filing a police report. Like what investigation has to go into that? So that, those are the things that we have to be cognizant of. Just merely filing a police report is not gonna typically bring you the redress, but if that person um, is aware of it, potentially maybe they'll come clean and give the money back. I mean, that's a possibility. And if that- Does that affect the prosecution then? Uh, does no. Does the crime go away? It doesn't go <laughs> no, away, the right? crime does not go All away. Right. No, it's, it's good. It will bear better for them in court. If they said, well, I've returned sense. all of the money, that'll be better for them. But there's still a crime committed. And we've talked about being able to go against an individual civilly and criminally, but uh, does that allow the victim to double their money? 
talk to that. <laughs> I think the civil attorney has addressed that. She said, you don't, you, you don't get two bites there. There's only one bite at the apple, okay? So once you get your money back, it's back. <laughs> right. Right. One of the other uh, uh, questions and issues that the group had brought uh, to our attention is let's say the individual that's running this Ponzi scheme has collected all this money, but now has filed bankruptcy. Uh, so are there still uh, yes definitely I, I think a lot of people a lot of times you see bankruptcy and you say okay well I guess I'm never gonna get my money back but under bankruptcy you can file a separate lawsuit it's called an adversary proceeding and you have to show fraud um, or any type of fraudulent transfers or anything like that so you can definitely hire a lawyer to file a separate lawsuit, and that lawsuit is basically saying, even though you filed bankruptcy and you can wipe out your debt, I don't want my debt to be wiped out because you committed fraud against me. So I definitely suggest if that ever happens, to definitely talk to a bankruptcy lawyer that's gonna be able to do that. And it could be that all of their other debts are wiped out under bankruptcy, but under that adversary proceeding, your debt will not get wiped out and if you win your debt won't get wiped out and they can file bankruptcy 20 times in their lifetime and they will never let your debt be wiped out like student loans like student loans <laughs> <laughs> or taxes <laughs> this when the separate legal case the separately individually or team or or the group, the group. Like a class action, yeah, should class be action. Class action. Under bankruptcy? Yeah. No, you're against the bankruptcy. For civil case. Yeah. For civil Under case. bankruptcy, yeah. correct. So it would be whoever the person owes money to. So if you have a group, then the group can file an adversary proceeding together against them. Okay, thank you. I have one more question on there and I've just lost it. Uh, Um, so I can't see you because I mean, you were saying something about um, victims not coming forward and that, that is the biggest problem. My mom has been a victim and I'm actually doing a lot of work for her because she can't, you know, she doesn't speak either or she has no resources. Um, but a lot of seniors, they, they're very afraid to report their crimes and what they lost because the cash that they've been hiding for years, right? They feel like they're gonna be penalized for, you know, putting it in somewhere, and they'll be popped up and get hit with taxes. <coughs> so, and th they're always worried about it. And I tell them maybe, you know, that that's not gonna be the case because you're the victim. But could you just tell us a little bit more about about if you're been a victim, will that money be investigated and they'll be hit with taxes? And that that's what this perpetrator is telling everybody: don't report because your money that you gave me. We're gonna, you know, you're gonna get the hit with the taxes, and that's what I would do. Make sure that will happen to you. So, just me. Yeah, that sounds like a complex question, because if they have earned that money, and they've already paid their taxes, and they decide to put it under their mattress, that's their business. Okay. And that's not anything that the government's gonna go after because they just happen to have cash. Cash is still, you know, still good, but you know, we don't want to scare people if something's been taken from you it's been taken and if they use that as a method to try to get people from not reporting I don't think that's a worry that they have to really be concerned about um, because they lost that cash and they're concerned about the IRS coming after them I'm not an IRS attorney but I do not believe the IRS would support uh, folks' money being taken from them and then a threat of the IRS. If anything, the person that's saying that is the one that needs to be investigated. Okay. Okay, thank you. And Sue, if you'll talk, we talked a lot about hiring an attorney in the civil realm because, of course, in the prosecution, in the criminal realm, the DA's office is going to be pursuing that case and the victim doesn't have to hire their own attorney. I got that question a lot when I was a prosecutor, when I would talk to victims, they would say, well, do I need to go and hire my own attorney to prosecute this? I'm like, you know, no, that's what, that's what I'm here <laughs> doing. Uh, but in the civil realm, do they have to have an attorney? Do they have to hire 
an attorney or can they file the case on their own? Um, you can always represent yourself. I highly suggest hmm. that you don't, especially in a case like this that may be very difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have the right to represent yourself um, pro se in court and in civil cases, criminal cases. But again, um, in cases like this, there's, it's, so comp it's so complicated and um, you are gonna have issues with evidence and discovery and so I do highly suggest that you do find a lawyer to pursue the claim. Um, and if I can just kind of go back, I think another issue with victims in the Korean community, um, they may not be a legal resident or a citizen in this country, and I, I've often heard that, and you know, they may be a victim of any type of crime, and they're scared to report it because they don't want that to be an issue. Do you do you guys want to talk a little bit about that? I think that's something that is very prevalent in our community. Well, I will tell you that um, when you report a crime, um, as a prosecuting agency, our primary concern should always be your safety and ensuring that <clears throat> we're addressing your concerns. So the notion that the question would come up, well, where did the money come from? Or that should not be at the forefront of the mind. Um, so I can say, you know, from my experience, that's never been a question that I've had. I've never asked, well, how did your mother come up with $20,000 for them to steal? That's none of my business. The point is, you know, your mother had $20,000 and somebody stole it and it was not theirs to steal and we're going to deal with that. So whether she saved her tip money for 10 years or whether she won a scratch off ticket or that's not my business because it was hers and somebody else stole it and that's what we're there to address. Now I can't speak to the IRS and what triggers them. I can tell you I have never called the IRS criminal <laughs> things. I have never called on a, on a victim and said, hey, I have a victim who lost a lot of money and I think he should look into their bank account. That's not something that I'm inclined to do and I... Somehow they feel like they're open. And I will say this, I will say that um, people who prey on victims and who do things like this um, are bullies, right? And so they're going to say whatever they can to maintain that power and to maintain that intimidation over their victims. And they're going to do whatever they can to keep them quiet. And that includes saying, you know, nobody's going to believe you. It includes saying, you know, you're going to get in trouble if you say anything. Or this is going to get you in trouble if you say anything. It's the same bullying tactics that you see across the board from domestic violence to exploitation, right? Like, who's going to believe you? Who cares? This is, you didn't have the right to this money, so I'm going to take it. Well, that's nonsense, right? So, no, prosecutors are not there to report you to the IRS. They're not there to ask you how you saved your money. That's your money. Nobody else has the right to take it from you. Um, and that's what our primary concern should be. And Ms. Ostergatson, is the DA's office concerned about what someone's um, citizenship status is, is that going to play at all into whether or not the DA's office goes forward on a prosecution? Your citizenship is not an issue when it comes to us prosecuting a crime against you. Matter of fact, if you do have a crime against you and you're having immigration <coughs> issues, uh, we would help issue you what's called a U visa to say that you are a victim of a crime, therefore you should be here with no qualms about um, the case because you've been victimized. So we would work and help you obtain a U visa so that you could be a witness in that situation. So that is not an issue because everyone that is here in Gwinnett County that becomes victimized, we will prosecute and it does not matter whether you have a good immigration status or whatever, you're here, so we're here to protect you. And on the same line, if the, uh, the defendant is not a citizen and flees the country, even though there are charges pending, does the DA's office have a way to still hold that individual accountable? Yes, we do. Hopefully there's, um, wherever they're going is an extradition provision and we would work on making sure that 
the defendants held accountable by getting him back here if he did in fact flee. And we've got uh, Matt Reeves that's joined us. I want to give him an opportunity to introduce himself. Thank you, uh, Judge Kaysen and uh, everybody who's come. Matt Reeves, I'm a uh, business lawyer. I uh, lived here in Duluth about 20 years. Uh, happened to have a legal proceeding in Monroe, and that's uh, a long way there. So I'm close to home, but uh, I apologize for the tardiness. And I'm glad to jump into some of the financial issues at the right time. I could do it now or just in response to questions, but I thought of some good things. So, yeah, we've talked about um, how victims have different options about perhaps getting their money back. We've talked about the criminal and the civil. Have you had any situations where you represented individuals and had to use the civil justice system to get those um, financial assets back for your victims? Absolutely. Um, one way is insurance. So talk to your insurance agent and make sure that you've got employee theft insurance and uh, ask them what are some things I need to do to maintain that coverage? Uh, one thing that can knock your coverage out is if you give grace to an employee who you've caught stealing, and then if they come back and steal from you a second time, insurance may knock that out of coverage. So educate yourself on the kind of coverage you can get and how you can keep that coverage, because sometimes insurance um, can keep your business alive. It could put a, you know, a small business or a church out of business to have a large theft. I got a call. Uh, during spring break out of town from a, a worried pastor who had a, a financial uh, person who stole over $100,000 from a, a small church and uh, it's uh, you know it's a tragedy when something like that happens but preventive medicine uh, and, and preventive actions uh, that's how to take it and I want to encourage uh, folks to uh, you know people you should trust licensed professionals CPAs attorneys um, you know the law enforcement um, paper trail documentation um, do your homework and pick an investment based on sound advice not all information out there on the internet is of the same quality but um, some things to be skeptical about cash transactions if people are forcing you into doing business based on large amounts of cash unlicensed informal people particularly if they're exploiting your trust and they're pressuring you trying to make you to make a quick decision and go wire money at you know Western Union or something if they're name dropping and they're trying to you know get uh, favor or trust uh, by dropping names um, also I, I had an unfortunate situation where a senior citizen here in this community was defrauded because there was this sophisticated um, senior predator who um, uh, said they were from Publishers Clearinghouse and was dropping Warren Buffett's name and you know I looked that up that's out there on the internet about that scam it's a uh, repeat scenario that criminals use um, and they call seniors on the phone and um, you know they get a list of seniors and they call them and one thing you ought to be picking how to spend your money if they are approaching you and, and trying to sell you that's something just to be wary of it's not always bad but uh, you know that's something to look out for is what, it generally the whole if it's too good to be true yes. it probably isn't yes and also um, for seniors uh, who are listening the older you are the more conservative you should be with your money and so if you have a high-risk investment you need to make sure you get plenty of advice from trusted professionals before you engage in that don't uh, you know lose money on something that uh, is some special deal. Uh, real estate transfers outside of closings. Here in Georgia, real estate closings are supposed to be done by lawyers, and if you have somebody getting uh, a deed signed for a loan or to transfer real estate, that's a red flag. Build a support network. Family, friends, licensed uh, professional advisors. Ask multiple trusted people what they think. Don't hide it to yourself. That senior citizen who got defrauded with that publisher's clearinghouse scam her son lived right down the street and she didn't involve him and uh, her bank said we're gonna freeze the account temporarily because we're skeptical about what's going on she switched banks so you know have your have your support network um, and uh, you know get get good advice because there's there's good advice out there now let me throw one thing out um, Matt is one of the issues that has been brought up is that there may be a reluctance 
to come forward because they did pay cash and is that going to affect whether or not they can go forward on a case or get their money back if they did in fact give cash instead of something with a paper trail well that gets back to the that's a great question that gets back to the licensed professionals people who you can invest trust on uh, and get advice from CPAs, lawyers, law enforcement. You shouldn't be concerned about uh, telling trusted, safe people about the situation who are there to, to help. Um, if, if there's a, a situation where you do something you regret, but you feel like you were um, violated and somebody broke the law and uh, uh, being a predator and defrauding you, and I think um, the benefit of reporting, whether it's cash or not, is is um, far it far outweighs any concerns about that. So I would. It sounds like there was an agreement on the panel to go ahead and report it and uh, let people know, even if you do regret that, um, because uh, I think that you know law enforcement. If there's one senior who's getting defrauded, there's there's probably others who are getting defrauded with a similar scheme. And so law enforcement wants to know about it so they could do something about it, whether it's cash or not. I would say with cash, you know, be careful on that. Be street smart. Um, carrying around a lot of cash, having a lot of cash around the house, you know, doing business in large amounts of cash. That just, you know, in this in this economy and this community, we've got a million people in Gwinnett, we've got five million people in Atlanta. Cut on the news and you'll see that's a high risk habit to be in. You know, trust uh, some banks or credit unions or safe places to keep your money and uh, get a good accountant who can help you uh, walk through what to keep in cash versus what to put in the bank because you don't want somebody breaking in your house, your car, when you're getting gas at the gas station because they know that you've got cash and that you're a, you know, a target. And let me take that and then uh, throw this to Ms. Austin Gatson. Going back to that cash concept that we didn't really kind of talk about earlier, is that going to present problems for the prosecution being able to actually prove how much money was taken? I would say yes and yes. That would be a big problem because we won't have any type of paper trail when it comes to cash. What we would have is kind of like um, he said, she said, if you're saying that this is the cash that I put into it, and you don't have anything to document it, that will be a problem. But at the same time, because it is, is going to be problematic, you still need to come forward regardless. Right. You'll still be able to prosecute or become a credibility issue, correct? Yes, that's correct. Right. So it doesn't bar being able to recover, it just may uh, throw up a little roadblock. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's true. Sure. Um, so in our specific case, there are seniors who wrote checks to people they don't know just so that this perpetrator can get money from that person who cashed for them. Will, will these people be prosecuted? It's, it's kind of like money laundering. It's, it's kind of, but they have no idea what's going on. Like they just did it and they have copies of the checks that I've seen the checks. Yes. I think highlighting the concept of money laundering is a great idea because in that Publishers Clearinghouse and Warren Buffett scam, that was one of the tactics that the predators used with the seniors. They had seniors sending money to other seniors as a Ponzi scheme and a lot of the money um, that was ending up to the bad guys, it was um, being laundered, it was, it, it was cash or products. There was one gentleman in New York who was shipping products overseas, purchased with cash, and uh, anytime you get into uh, uh, transferring checks or cash or products of value to somebody you don't know at somebody's request, that's dangerous. You need to stop and, and ask why are they doing that and um, you know what's going on here because um, money laundering is something that drug dealers do, human trafficking people do, and people who are trying to launder money from taxing authorities and, and uh, uh, that's a red flag that something bad is going on. So um, money laundering extortion, you know, if, if somebody catches you doing a small crime and then they steal a large amount of money from you to try to, you know, hold that over your head and threaten you, blackmail and extortion and, and uh, a tactic like that gets used sometimes, money laundering. 
uh, as well as these schemes you see on the internet. So, um, so, will, the, so will the people who wrote the checks, right. will they get in trouble? So yeah, I want to address that. So there's an element of intent and knowledge that needs to be addressed as well, right? And so if they, if they have no idea what they're doing, they think they're just writing a check to help a friend out, um, the prosecutors, we have a great deal of discretion. We have, uh, we have to approach these cases with common sense as well. And and so, yeah, are there ways that you can loop people in be just because the law says possibly? Is that the right thing to do in this case? If you have a bunch of seniors who are thinking that they're just, you know, writing checks out to help their friends out, pulling them into this case as like an accessory, that's not justice, and that's not the right thing to do. Uh, without more information, right? Um, so there's more to it than that. You have to consider, did they know? Should they have known? How much of a role did they play in this? As opposed to, did they think they were just writing a check for what basis, right? Am I writing you a $20 check thinking I'm gonna get back $5,000? And is that a reasonable exchange? Versus am I just sending you a check thinking, you know, this is like a reasonable amount of a, of a check and I'm helping a friend out and not realizing I'm getting involved in a big scheme. I mean, it's like $100,000, you know, it, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, right. but um, like people my age won't think they'll never do something like that, but his seniors, they're like, okay, just send me to this bank account, wire it, and under this person's name, like, okay, buy it when tomorrow, right? They just wire the cash. And that's an element as well, right? You have to look at the knowledge component, you have to look at their capacity, you have to look at you know, should they have known what are right. we as prosecutors Do have they to know step exactly back. what they were getting into. Right. The and and so that's our job I think as prosecutors to step back and really look at the whole picture and not just because I always say when you're a hammer everything is a nail. When we're dealing with these types of cases, when you're dealing with elder adults, when you're dealing with people who might have diminished capacities and sensitive issues, you sometimes have to take a step back and you have to look at it with a more sensitive lens and just look at it a little differently at times and really think about what this justice really requires. So, right. so, so I know one of the issues that we had discussed when they came to my office um, is that this individual was um, scamming people from all over the country and this individual may or may not even live in the same community that we're in. What kind of um, roadblocks does that create as far as being able to prosecute and who would be the one that they would really need to go to to, to get something done on their case? If they live, wait, can you repeat that? If sure. Live. If the offender doesn't live in the same community they do, or if there are multiple victims all over the country, what kind of issues does that cause? I'll answer that real quick and I don't know if anyone else would like to add to it, but I we have to, of course, look at venue, like where did the crime happen? But at the same token, you do have other recourse. We have the U.S. Attorney's Office that can look into these type of cases also when there's a conspiracy and things of that nature. And that's one thing we do, that I do as a district attorney here in, in Gwinnett County, I will collaborate. If it's not anything that my office can deal with effectively, I'll pick up the phone call the U.S. Attorney and say, look, we have this, that, and the other. Can you assist? So there are different ways to go about dealing with it. And the, the key is to get to get some justice and fairness done for you. And we'll, we will like turn over all stones to find a way to help when someone has been victimized. So you really don't have to worry about that. Just bring the information. We will find a way to help you. If, even if the person is you know, somewhere else in the country. We will find a way to help on that situation. So you mean it will start with the local police and then, you know, depending on the severity of the case, it will go a little higher. It up. could go higher. Okay. It can definitely go, go higher. So you start here, and we'll work as hard as we can. If we do have a venue problem, you know, we can contact other jurisdictions and other um, agencies to, to step in. Um, I won't, I won't, I know what you want to talk about, so I'll leave that off limits, but um, elder abuse, did y'all talk about elder abuse before I got here? Good. Because that, that's something, the senior citizen here in Duluth, um, I believe her bank called the elder abuse hotline 
and the uh, elder abuse uh, social worker came out and uh, did an interview and the next thing you know between uh, the elder abuse uh, uh, department and the Duluth police the person up in New York who the lady was sending money to was getting interviewed by the police up there and unfortunately found out that the bad guys were overseas and in Jamaica and and all that and we're really you know hard sophisticated criminals uh, so it's going to be tough to get the money back but it at least sort of stopped a bunch of victimization going on because these seniors were driving around going to the UPS store you know sending money sending uh, products and spending their free time in their golden years as victims in this Ponzi scheme and and they were convinced by these predators that the money was coming in next week constantly and it, it's sad, but I'll let you talk about another good idea. So in Georgia, we have a great statute called the RICO statute, which allows, a, it's a great tool. Um, in my office, we currently use RICO. Well, one of the options you can use is if you have multiple jurisdictions that you kind of reach into different jurisdictions, to kind of pull things together. Um, so you can cross county lines, you can cross venue lines if you need to, if things are kind of happening in a blurred way. It kind of is kind of a great opportunity as a catch-all if for a conspiracy, co-conspirators, two or more people involved in a criminal enterprise, right? Um, so RICO is a great opportunity to deal with, um, you have two or more people involved in an enterprise and you may not have it all fit neatly within the confines of jurisdiction of a county, um, within county lines, um, but it still needs to be handled. So you still might have the opportunity for local uh, prosecutors to handle that case, but it kind of expands your options a little. Um, so those are also some tools that we have as prosecutors. Um, the Attorney General's Office um, is also a great asset and a great tool when dealing with these kind of financial crimes and these kinds of schemes that go on as well. Um, and we work closely with them in some of those tools, but RICO is definitely one of my go-to when it comes to cases like this. I think Eugenie had a question. Yes, um, I'm using Korean news at Atlanta. Uh, I have a, the important question. We have today, tonight, the two future the legislation in Georgia, right? So the, I suggest that this is on the Fungi scheme. Even though the senior, we even though we just educated them, they still want to to get money for their son, their daughter, right? So I researched by myself, that company not registered in Georgia. So how about the bill, the, if the, any company online or um, um, private funding company not registered in Georgia cannot work here? This is basically we yeah, prevent yes, doing that. Sure. Yeah. Um, here's my experience, and I, I've been doing this 20 years. Unfortunately, about about once a year, you'll see an embezzlement situation, and one of them comes from unlicensed securities. When somebody has a company and they're collecting money as an investment, or um, you know, come become a co-owner, and you're supposed to go through a licensing process and and be on the up and up. And the Secretary of State's office has a securities. Uh, licensing and uh, regulation and investigation unit and so making sure that uh, not only the local authorities with Gwinnett police and our city police but the uh, the securities fraud unit at the Secretary of State's office if it goes across county lines has the ability to get in there and work with the Attorney General's office to crack down on Ponzi schemes that are you know across uh, lines on unregistered securities. Is there anything you want to add on that one? You, you know, it is it is very difficult to prevent a business from operating anywhere that they want to operate. So um, that I think what you're asking is a little difficult. However, I think that's why we do what we do. I think um, especially the prosecutors' offices and getting people out there and getting people educated. Um, in these type of crimes and making sure that everybody's educated in how they should be careful with money and who they should invest money to, I think that's going to be the most important. And obviously there are certain laws that will help victims, but I think be, be, before that it's more important to have these educational seminars and making sure that people understand. And I know we've talked about reporting, and I want to go back a little bit 
you know, we've stressed the importance of making sure uh, individuals come forward and report the crime, but I don't know that we really touched on what's going to have to happen after that initial report. And of course, there's some reluctance even to report. There's increased reluctance to actually participate. So explain what else, uh, either in a criminal prosecution or a civil action, has to happen after that initial report is made or that initial suit is filed so that everyone has that full information of what's going to be required to go forward. See something, say something. Just make sure that we know what's going on. Once there has been a police report made, as I stated earlier, there has to be an investigation. It's not merely just going in telling the police what happened. They have yeah. to investigate it because they have to de develop what's called probable cause in order to arrest that individual that's gonna be a criminal matter. So they have to have time to do that. It's not something that's instantaneous, overnight. You make a report and then tomorrow everything's hunky-dory. That's not how it works. Um, the system, as I'm sure you all have heard, grinds slowly. You know, the criminal justice system is the same way. Unfortunately, we cannot just wave a magic wand and make everything good. It takes long, hard, arduous work to make sure that people are not victimized. And we need you to make a report. That's the beginning. You make a report, and then once the police have investigated typically what will happen, they will send a file up to the DA's office. And we'll review it again. And we'll talk to witnesses, we'll talk to victims. And you, got, you have to be willing to testify. You have to be willing to do that. Because otherwise we won't make out our case. And that's what I wanted to make sure they understood yes. that it doesn't just stop at the reporting of it. And if either Matt or Sue want to talk about uh, in the civil context what is required after that initial suit is filed. Sure. And this is another reason why it's important to get some records that you could give to an attorney, a CPA, or a court case when you're making an important investment. Uh, if you don't have records when you part with your money, if something goes wrong, it's going to weaken your ability to recoup it. I still think you ought to call the cops and go talk to a lawyer, but it may make your case weaker or more difficult. But in the civil context, when you hire a lawyer, the lawyer will interview you and file a lawsuit on your behalf against the bad guy. Uh, the lawsuit's filed, the other side gets an opportunity to answer. If they deny the lawsuit, then you get to send them discovery, which is called written discovery first. You can do a document request. You could also do a third party document request where you're sending a request to the bank or to some witness. Uh, you can send interrogatories, which are questions they have to answer in writing. The thing that I was late coming from was a deposition in Monroe where you have a court reporter and you have witnesses under oath testifying and being subject to questioning. And then um, you have litigation that goes before judges like Judge Kaysen uh, with motions and eventually it would go to a jury trial. Now, very few percentages of cases go to a jury trial, a lot get settled. And so by filing a lawsuit and having strong evidence, that's when the other side will say rather than spending time and money uh, having this aired out in court, I'm going to settle and um, um, compensate uh, the person who I did wrong. So that's why it's important to have those records because that's your case. So your word, that's good, but if your word plus a document, that's what I call enhanced testimony, enhanced evidence. So back your word up with some records. And if we do have to go to court, it doesn't settle. Um, what can they expect then? Either one. Yeah. Well, um, let me, let me, I'm going to kind of elaborate on what Matt had said. Um, so there is that discovery process where you can send questions, you can depose the other person, but you as the plaintiff, the one that's suing, the defendant that you're suing also has a right to send you questions and ask for documents and to depose you. So. I always make sure that when we, before we file suit, you are also going to be having to, just like as a victim, you also have to participate. There are things that you're gonna have to open up yourself to, 
Um, and a lot of times people are very reluctant. Um, I, I know a lot of my Korean clients are very reluctant, like why do I have to do all this since I'm the one that's suing? But that is the legal process and that's the civil lawsuit process. And so be prepared that if you do that, you're also going to be subject to the same things as well. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the question? You have, yes. So if after all of the evidence and discovery is exchanged um, and if, say a plea is offered and it's criminal and they decide they're not going to accept responsibility and go to a jury trial or a bench trial in front of Judge Kaysen, um, they're entitled to a, a trial where they say they're not guilty. And, and is that a public trial? Is anybody can watch that? It is a public trial. Our courtrooms here in Georgia are all open. That means anybody can come in and sit down in court and listen to all of the proceedings. There are very, very few trials in the state of Georgia that are closed proceedings. And this is not going to be one of the ones that will qualify for a closed proceedings. And let me just interrupt and say, even if before you get to trial, is the fact that the lawsuit was filed and the individuals involved, is that public as well? Everything is public record from all of the filings, the lawsuit, the indictment. Um, what's happening in the courtroom is all public record. And so if this goes to a trial, that means um, if you're the victim and the defendant is saying that they're not guilty, that they didn't steal from you, um, they're going to get up and they can have an attorney who's going to cross-examine you on the stand. That means the state, if I'm the prosecutor and I say, you know, I'm saying that this defendant stole from, you know, your mother, I would put your mother on the stand and your mother would testify and say, you know, this person stole my money and this is what they stole. Their attorney would have the right to get up and cross-examine your mother and say, you know, she's lying or she doesn't know what she's talking about. Now, my job as the prosecutor is to do my best to protect my victims and to ensure that they are not mistreated on the stand. But that doesn't always mean that whatever happens is nice, right? And it can get rough and it can get uncomfortable. And I have to warn my witnesses and victims that they are subject to cross-examination. And unfortunately, well, in Georgia, the defendant is entitled to a thorough and sifting cross. That means their attorney can really go at whoever they have on cross. And so it's important that people understand that. And I like to really prep my witnesses and victims before they take the stand to understand how thoroughly they may be subject to cross. That means things that might come up that make them uncomfortable, things that they might be embarrassed about, things that they may not want people to know about because it's, it could be fair game. Now, we do our due diligence to try to make sure that we keep it within the scope of why we're there, um, but there, there's still sometimes some risk of things coming out that you may not want to come out, but that is something that could happen, and I try my best to warn people before they take the stand. And, and in the civil realm, Matt, um, did the attorney serve that role as well as like in the discovery process? being able to make sure that the individual that you filed suit against is not just going on a fishing expedition and making sure that they're trying to go and get stuff just to embarrass the plaintiff. Are y'all able to uh, manage that? Absolutely. There's law on the books that you, uh, discovery can't be abused to harass or humiliate somebody and you can uh, object and sort of screen and limit the scope of any harassment that you're getting. One good news that I wanted to make sure everybody knew, the Gwinnett courts are great about translators. And the judge and district attorney, uh, y'all talk about that some. Uh, I had a case about a chopsticks factory in South Georgia a while back, and everything was in Korean, in writing, and then um, a lot of the witnesses uh, did not speak much English. And Gwinnett uh, does everything we can in the court system to remove uh, the language barrier. So don't be hesitant to investigate your case by virtue of a language barrier, go ahead and get a lawyer and encourage them to make sure we get everything translated in writing and orally. And if you do file suit, uh, we do give you that information of whether or not you need a translator. So don't be shy about that. As, as Matt said, the courts have access to all different types of language uh, translators. And as long as you tell us that, we're going to have one for your case no cost to you. It's going to be provided so that anyone has access to our courts regardless of what language they speak. That was a great point. 
This is uh, if um, victims want to make a file, the law case, uh, the legal case, but the victim didn't know the, uh, what is it, Her, what is it? Bad guy. Yeah, the bad guy. <laughs> the bad guy, their address, they didn't know that. How can I make a file? There's a, the missing. So some of the news is um, uh, he or she was in our country or some other state, lived there. All their address is fake. So the victims cannot realize that where he live or she live there. How can do it? Go ahead, so you all should take it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for civil cases, we have skip tracers and we have investigators that we hire. Um, so, and they do an amazing job. They find people that I would never have thought that they would find. Um, obviously, it's going to be difficult if they're out of the country, but it is, it is something that they will continue to do. And at one point or another, if they've done so much work in, in the United States, um, and I've had cases like that where they may have gone out of the country for a little bit just to, just to make sure that they're not getting sued or they're not getting arrested, but they're eventually going to come back. And so we, we do have investigators that we hire in order to find them. Well, on on that senior citizen scam with Publishers Clearinghouse, uh, you know the little old lady here in Duluth, senior citizen, she didn't know who the ultimate bad guy was who was getting the money, but she certainly knew the phone number and the uh, identity of the person who was uh, harassing her and pressuring her, and so you know <clears throat> call the police, make the report. And as the district attorney can tell you, the way you get the big drug dealer is to get the folks on the street and they will quickly start, you know, ratting out the, the bad guys who are getting all the money uh, if they're the ones who are in trouble uh, with the law. So go ahead and make the report and let law enforcement investigate because that's how you get the big fish is by, you know, finding the people who you do know are out there committing crime at the street level. It'll uh, eventually go up to the top of the, the uh, pyramid scheme. Um, I guess this is probably the most important question that we have um, is lack of evidence. 90% of these people are seniors, it, it's all cash, and they have no trace. Probably only about, like, probably less than 10%. They have checks that's not written under the name of perpetrator, it's somebody else's. Um, in cases like this, I know it's very difficult to, to find charges, um, but Having a lot of people and a lot of money, would it help? Would it be you know, used in due of lack of having, like not having a lot of evidence? And also, um, if this is, if you guys can criminally prosecute this person, will the civil case be easier? Will, will it be better? I think, are you asking if there are multiple victims, even though they may not have yeah, the, there's the, so many. Of, there's hundreds of them. Right. So if there are multiple victims that still may not have the paper trail, does that make the case stronger? stronger right. That's the question you're asking, yes, right? Yes. Yep. And their stories are the same? They, they, it's all exactly the same story. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's a few right. hundred, few million dollars. So, so, yeah. And will that make the civil case stronger if there is a prosecution or investigation um, for prosecution? I'll just speak on the criminal side of it, but I think that if you do have a lot of victims, we're going to look at it even harder. We have some top-notch investigators just within our office that can check into everything. And like I said earlier, we will not leave any stone unturned. We will look and try to find redress for people that have been victimized. Lisa Marie, if you'll talk to that too, when you have multiple victims in a criminal case, what that can do for that criminal case. So the evidence, we, we often say we follow the evidence, right? And so if there isn't, we have direct evidence and we have circumstantial evidence. And so if we have a lot of victims, we might have heavier circumstantial evidence where we may not ever be able to necessarily prove the amount of money, but we might be able to prove the theft itself. And so that might be helpful. Um, it, we might have a problem getting to the dollar amount level because of That's it, probably what it is. right? But with the amount of people, it might be enough to get us over the threshold to get us to the felony amount, right? And so, yes, the 
while we would prefer to have better quality over quantity, um, I think in a case like this, where we could use enough circumstantial evidence, it's possible to build on that case. I will say though, it makes it difficult because a skilled defense attorney um, can, can chop through a circumstantial case, right? A skilled defense attorney can really like kind of like poke holes in that. Um, however, that doesn't mean you don't try and it doesn't mean you give up. Um, so I will say that. And a criminal case does not bar you from trying a civil action ever, right? So I, and I can't stress that enough. So even if the criminal case fails, because again, there's just too much, there's only circumstantial evidence, that does not bar a civil action at all. And- Does that have though? Does you know, criminal case, having criminal case going have the civil case? at the same time so so talk to if there are let's say there's a hundred plaintiffs do they each have to file their own civil suit or can they file as a group address that issue if you have a very large number of plaintiffs they could do what's called a class action and there are from time to time on ponzi scheme type situations class action suits where you have thousands of people who are notified about fraud. Um, the, the biggest example of somebody getting acquitted on a criminal matter and then uh, having a civil judgment is O.J. Simpson. You know, he got acquitted on the criminal case, but he has not had a bank account or held any money since then because he had a large civil judgment. So at the civil standard, it's 50% or more uh, criminal is, you know, 99.99% beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not to We're a mathematical certainty. It's okay. not to a right. mathematical certainty. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, a civil, that's a civil lawyer translating it, but you've got to be, on the criminal side, you've got to be convinced. On the civil side, it's just got to be more likely than not, so you have higher standards in a lot of ways. But, uh, sorry, sorry to be put the legal standard. But, but here's what I would say. If you have been a victim of fraud, um, if it's criminal in nature, go ahead and report it to the police. Let the police make up their decision about the evidence. And uh, I think it can help to have numerous people showing the modus operandi of the bad guy and how their uh, scheme is working, because uh, that will help prevent uh, and disrupt that scheme uh, and prevent other victims. And on the civil side, go talk to a lawyer. Go talk to a lawyer and let the lawyer worry about the quality of the evidence. Don't let your perception about lack of evidence to sway you from reporting it to someone who uh, possibly can help because you know what even if you don't get recourse you can prevent other people from getting victimized and you can get the the, uh, the bad guy to leave town if they know that the police or lawyers are investigating them here in atlanta That's you know they'll leave and and uh, go somewhere else which is what we want we want to get them out of victimizing people here in our community and uh, protect our community. And you know what? You've got you got people up here who care. Uh, you care. And uh, um, the bad guys operate in the shadows. So bring things to the light. Like the district attorney said, if you see something, say something, and get good sound advice if you, if there's victimization going on. Man, I have a question. For you. Um, is there is there a number of victims required to file a class action lawsuit? Class action is normally very large numbers where it's hundreds, usually it's thousands or hundreds of thousands. Yes, there is a process both in state court and federal court to get a class action certified. Uh, it's not based mainly on the number, but it's based on factors, but numerosity is one of them. If you've got you know, 75 plaintiffs, that's probably not a class action. If you've got 7,500 plaintiffs, that probably is a a class action or 75,000 or 750,000 but good question but yeah there's a, a there's a screening analysis that's done to get a class action certified and that's something to uh, get a an experienced lawyer to look at because both the the plaintiff's lawyers and the defense lawyers are very experienced on class actions you want to have somebody who has some experience and knowledge in that area to evaluate that issue so to follow up on that if it doesn't qualify as a class action can you still have a large group of plaintiffs 
file one suit or do they have to file individually if it's not a class action? Um, Georgia law is very um, uh, lenient and deferential to numerous plaintiffs gathering together about the same or similar matter against the same defendant. So um, you can have many plaintiffs who join together and choose to sue together against the defendant and that's it's a strategic decision you want to have a knowledgeable lawyer and uh, you want to have confidentiality and also the diligence you want to know your lawyers working hard for you so that's something that will impact you want to join with others or do it by yourself but um, you know certainly uh, that is something to, to evaluate and even if you can't get a class action you can get many people to join in together and that can scare you know the defendants uh, a lot of times if they see that oh no uh, I'm gonna have 75 people telling you know about how my scheme worked out and how they got their money stolen two more questions probably his questions uh, to to uh, had to guess it, but, uh, is it is it better to uh, group up and, and make a report it, or it's better to do individually well, when there's a large group of victims do, do they have to I don't think there's any problem with people going to the police department as a group to tell them this is what happened I think that um, it probably will help because what they can do is focus in on the defendant or the people that are causing the issue in the community. If they see that it's hurting the community and it's many folks out there, I think that they will sit down, get their detectives moving on it to try to see what they can um, investigate and bring forward. So I don't think it's hurtful. I think it helps. if if. Like, let's say, for example, if you, if you get one person to go one day, one person the next day, and the next day, and the next day, they're going to be like, what the heck is going on? So if you just go in there and tell them what happened, as then a as a group, there's no harm in that. I don't believe there's a harm in that at all. I think it would be helpful because it would help them focus more quickly than just people going in slowly and drips and drabs. Just go in, let them know what's going on so it can be handled. So, uh, non-victims, such as, uh, uh, you know, like Matt says, there's people, community who cares, other groups who cares, are they able to file uh, actions too, or, or just, just the victim, only victim can file uh, cases like this? Right, the person who has been victimized, I think Lisa Marie said earlier, if they're incapacitated, then that's one thing, then others can come and <coughs> assist. But the people that have been harmed need to come in and make the report. They need to come in and do it. You can be there with them to help. Yes. If you right. like. I have two questions <laughs> I mean, specifically for you. Uh, there are some different investment, so-called investments that are going around our community now that are very similar to what I might my mind experience. Um, the system hasn't collapsed, but people are saying, why report? Because you know we're all making money. There's there's no issue. Can can something like this be reported and for you guys to investigate and, and look into it and see if there's any proper registration, if there's you know, if, if it's legit. That's a huge question. Yeah, that, that sounds like a Matt question with <laughs> that, that's when it gets into the securities registration if you've had somebody who is from out of state and they're not licensed and they're saying let me sell you a piece of this company and they're gathered they're taking in money and you know they have some business opportunity I mean that gets close to unlicensed unregistered securities that you know is something that could be investigated and disrupted um, it might know. not be a real security it might just right. be what they say right um, but yeah again if you if you have a concern bring it to light if you think that uh, just because a Ponzi scheme is working temporarily doesn't mean that it's okay uh, because that's the real Bernie Madoff one of the worst ones he had some customers who made some money for a while and the way he got the big money is he gave folks some money along the way so people later that was the 
Yes. That's right. But so, it's not something police investigates, but mm -hmm. other authorities can, right? Well, you, yeah, the Secretary of State's office can, can oh, investigate okay. unlicensed securities. The police can look into, hey, what's going on here? And is this, so they can you know, report it. And, and, you know, the IRS and companies like that, if there's a bunch of cash running around and people aren't keeping books and, and all that, that's something that you have numerous government uh, law enforcement can take a look at and ask, is this a buildup to a fraud where a bunch of people are going to lose their life savings? Because that's such a tragedy when you've got seniors who've saved money and worked hard and played by the rules all their life and then somebody steals their money at the end. And you have you know, other federal agencies like the Security and Exchange Commission that regulate those companies and those investment companies that can also um, be alerted and take down these individuals that are running these illegal well, This companies. isn't something that, you know, if you just report it to Annapolis. Attorney General's you? Office might be a better phone call for you. The, the U.S. Attorney General's Office um, might be the AG. Well, like the, federal. Well, federal. it's a state agency, but they're more on the white collar oh, that right. side. Right. That might be a better, if you have concerns and you see a trajectory coming down that you're concerned about, you want to get ahead of it. I, I think that might be a, a better phone call to kind of get ahead of things. Thank you so much. Then on that same note, there's an organization called National Asian Pacific Center on Aging, and they also look into uh, exploitation, financial issues regarding um, older people. That's National Asian Pacific Center on Aging, and then the Department of Justice. You know, don't leave any stone unturned. Just go to everyone, any agency that can help out with what's going on because I think the biggest thing is getting the information out in the community so that others don't become victims of it. That is my biggest goal. And, that's the, and that is a perfect uh, statement to end on actually is that's exactly why we got this planned is to get the information out so that people can make informed decisions, whether it's with um, an investment scheme from someone outside their community, or it's an investment group within your community, as long as everyone has all of the information of what the pros and cons are. Because again, we're not saying, especially as it relates to the care, that that's not a good investment plan but just be informed as to what the pros and cons are. And then as it relates to the elder abuse, the exploitation, the financial schemes, make sure you're doing your due diligence and you know what you may need to take to law enforcement if in fact you are uh, built out of, out of your money. We just wanted to make sure we got the information out. We're gonna trust y'all to go spread that to others in your community so that people will know that if they see something, if something happens to them, to say something. And that's really what the bottom line is. Information is a valuable tool. And for y'all to have that and to use it is the only way that this kind of stuff can stop. So I do want to thank our panelists. I think they gave great information. I appreciate them uh, for being here, Clayton, for setting this up. Um, time. Um, I know we don't have many uh, audiences here, but believe me, these reporters, TV reporters, we have a daily newspaper reporters, they're the voice, they're the representing 100,000 Koreans here in Atlanta. So don't be discouraged so we don't have a smaller group. They will cover what we talked about today. It's going to be I it's gonna be out there. People, so I'll wow. <laughs> yeah, so it's gonna be out there. So uh, I really appreciate your time. 그리고 오늘 봐준 여러분 감사하고요. 이이 다섯 분을 이 다섯 분이 굉장히 우리가 그냥 뭐 쉽게 모실 수 있는 그런 분들이 아니에요 사실은. 그래서 많은 분들이 오셔서 좀 혜택을 받았으면 좋겠는데 뭐 바꾸시니까 어쩔 수 없지만 이 다섯 분들의 1년 월급이 얼마인지 아세요? <웃음> 굉장히 비싼 분들이거든요. Almost 2 million dollars a year. 이게 
and their salary for for a year. But, <laughs> <laughs> they are here. They are here just for us, not for a person. <laughs> Bring up, bring up, the average there. Well, we're, all, we're all public servants. Okay, the rest of us. Yes. 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 Yes.